Hello everyone and welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Jack Edwards. Welcome to the home library. I'm so pumped about this. So basically, <laughs> this is going to be like the final boss of book hauls because I have got stacks and stacks of books to talk to you about and I'm just buzzing. This is really and truly like you've reached Bowser's castle of book hauls. I fell asleep in the first maybe five minutes of the Mario movie and I'm absolutely devastated about it. <laughs> like, I basically got off a really long haul flight and I was still recovering from the jet lag and I went to see the Mario movie and I slept through almost all of it and I couldn't bring myself <laughs> to buy a second ticket and go to a second showing of the Mario movie. So I just don't know what happens for like most of it, but I kind of, if you've ever played any of the games, <laughs> the plot is pretty straightforward. Anyway, that's not the point. I wanted to talk to you about all of these books that I bought to stock my home library, because basically that was just the excuse that I used. <laughs> and I guess I have to start this with a quick disclaimer to say that it is not normal to buy this number of books. And I don't want to suggest that it is, or that it makes you more of a reader or more of a book fan the more books you buy, because that's absolutely not the case. I also think libraries are just the most <laughs> incredible place. But because I make content specifically about books, it makes sense for me to have the physical copies of them, just because visually it's more exciting to make videos about physical books. So just as a disclaimer, that's why I personally invest in a lot of physical books. And I generally do maybe like two big, big book hauls like this per year. One at the beginning of the year and then one around the middle. And so these books will be what I read for the rest of the year. So I've got about 50 books in this haul to show you. So without further ado, let's get on with it. I basically thought this would be a really fun video where you can just pop it on, grab a drink, get a little snack, and we can sit and nerd out about exciting literature for however long it takes <laughs> to talk about all of these books. We'll see. Firstly, I picked up this book because I made a video on my second channel, Jack in the Books, where I was talking about my favourite book titles of all time. So I have a page in one of my notebooks where I keep track of like book titles that I really love. And I said in that video, please let me know like your favourite book title of all time. And a couple of people commented this, by Grand Central Station, I sat down and wept. Holy hell, straight away I was like, I'm, I'm purchasing it. Without any other knowledge of this book, I need it in my life. Because that title is firstly so exquisite, so singular, but also so relatable. Except for me, it was by Norma's Pizzeria in Hell's Kitchen, New York. I sat down and wept. Anyway, this book was so fascinating to me. And then I started looking into it. And the story behind it is insane. So basically, the author of this book, Elizabeth Smart, who by the way, you know, she does what she says on the tin. She is smart, she is a genius, she is wise, but she also made some crazy decisions. So basically, she went to this bookshop in London and picked up a poetry collection and just fell in love with the poet's brain. So she researches him and finds out he's a Japanese poet and she pays for him and his wife to fly to the US. She falls in love with him, has four kids with him, and it was just this crazy, impassioned, turbulent love affair. And then she wrote this book about it. It's tender, it's heartbreaking, it's brutal. Every single sentence, pretty much, is a metaphor. So if you love flowery, really embellished, ornate writing, you will gobble this up. If you hate that stuff, you'll despise it. <laughs> and luckily I'm the former. As soon as this arrived, I sat down and read it and wept. So we started off with a bang. A lot of these books, in fact, almost all of these books I have not yet read, but this one I have. And I'm just mesmerized by it, completely and utterly infatuated. And I know I'm gonna return to it. I underlined so many pages and I think this is my new Bible. So that's book number one. Next, I have this book by Osamu Desai. This is The Flowers of Buffoonery, which I think is what I want to call my autobiography. Another cracking title, I have to say. I, for one, love buffoonery. I am all here for some buffoonery. <laughs> Good bit of buffoonery for the weekend. But basically, when I was in Japan earlier this year, I read No Longer Human by the same author, and it was so eloquent and articulate. It was also very existential. It's about a man who does not want to live. And this is the prequel to that book. It's also translated by Sam Betts. It says that it opens in a seaside sanatorium, and despite the kind of dispiriting backdrop, our central protagonist tries to maintain this kind of light-hearted, almost clownish mentality and approach to life, delving into the darkest corners of human consciousness, but also poking fun at these same emotions. That is the perfect mix for me. A book that can talk about a person in crisis and those really difficult, horrible moments, whilst also having fun with it 
Um, so I think The Flowers of Buffoonery is going to be really interesting to read. Now, sticking with the Japanese theme, I've got quite a few uh, translated Japanese books here. This next one is called Days at the Morisaki Bookshop. It's by Satoshi Yagasawa and translated by Eric Ozawa. From the beginning of summer to early spring, I lived at the Morisaki Bookshop. I spent that period of my life in the spare room on the second floor of the store, trying to bury myself in books. The cramped room barely got any light and everything felt damp. It smelled constantly of musty old books. That's my favourite fragrance, eau de novel. But I will always remember the days I spent there, because that's where my real life began. And I know, without a doubt, that if not for those days, the rest of my life would have been bland, monotonous, and lonely. The Morisaki Bookshop is precious to me. It's a place I know I'll never forget. A tale of families, love, new beginnings, and the comfort that can be found in books. As a book lover, I love reading books about books. My own novel that I've been working on, should I even say this? Yeah, why not? It starts with kind of an ode to books and literature, or at least it does in the current draft, the current manuscript that I've got, but it's definitely something that I always find myself gravitating towards, and as a book person, reading about the day-to-day -day workings of a bookshop, sign me up. Show me the dotted line, I will sign it. Also, one thing about me is if there's a book that is translated from Japanese with a cat on the cover, I'm buying it. I'm just really interested in Japanese storytelling. I really enjoy the way that they do these close character studies, these almost microscopic character studies. My personal reading taste always gravitates towards ordinary occurrences, normal lives, and seeing the beauty in them, and seeing the what's so fascinating about every single person. And I think that Japanese literature really captures that. So another Japanese book is this one, The Sailor Who Fell From Grace With The Sea. What a title. As you can tell, I'm a sucker for a good title, and these books are really delivering so far. So this is by Yokio Mishima and translated from the Japanese by John Nathan. A band of savage 13-year-old boys, firstly, every group of 13-year-old boys <laughs> is savage. I'm like, I am nearly double your age and I will still cross the street <laughs> to avoid you. I'm so scared. I've got all of my pubic hair. My voice has broken. I'm probably double your height and yet I'm still so scared. <laughs> I'll be crossing that road to get away from them. And yet the most scary thing you can ever encounter is a band of savage 13 year old boys. Anyways, these ones reject the adult world as illusory, hypocritical, and sentimental. When the mother of one of them begins an affair with a ship's officer, he and his friends idealize the man at first, but it is not long before they conclude that he is in fact soft and romantic. They regard this disillusionment as an act of betrayal on his part. Their retribution is deliberate, and horrifying. Oh, it's giving toxic masculinity. It's giving Kendom. <laughs> it's giving I am Kenuff. It's giving I'm just Ken. Anywhere else I'd be a 10. No, I'm kidding. I think that this is going to be very, very interesting to read about. And I'm intrigued to read a book that seems to center masculinity, but in a culture that is not the one that I personally have grown up in. You know, I'd be, I'd be interested to see how this is depicted in Japanese culture. So it's on the list. The next one is a tried and tested Japanese author who I love, or at least who I'm so intrigued by. I love reading his work, I don't always agree <laughs> with his sentiments, but he has this kind of filter over the world that he creates, and that is Haruki Murakami. Super interesting, very prolific Japanese author. This is a little collection called Desire. It's part of the Vintage Minis series. Who translated it? Oh, Jay Rubin, Ted Goosen, and Philip Gabriel. You've just passed someone on the street who could be the love of your life, the person you're destined for. What do you do? In Murakami's world, you tell them a story. The five weird and wonderful tales collected here each unlock the many-tongued language of desire, whether it takes the form of hunger, lust, sudden infatuation, or the secret longings of the heart. Ooh, I love just getting absorbed into Murakami's world. But the reason I bought this is because often I think that his depiction of desire is what I see as being quite problematic. So I'm interested by this to see how he represents desire specifically in five different contexts. Because often his depiction of women is a little bit questionable. So we'll see about that. You know, someone was recently flirting with me, I guess, and said something to me in a text like, I think you're great, Jack, no matter what the others say. And I was like, <laughs> well, thank you, but what do the, what do the others say? <laughs> you know, I was like, that feels like a backhanded compliment. Like, I didn't know the others <laughs> had something to say. They had a lot to say about me in the press. Miley, what's good? Anyways, continuing the trend of Japanese literature, this is Hit Parade of Tears, another story collection. Or maybe it's Hit Parade of Tears. Do you remember there's that, um, 
there's that, uh, like, shampoo that said no more tears, which meant, like, tears in your hair, but so many of us as kids thought it meant no more tears. I, <laughs> I thought that until, like, two weeks ago. I think it's Hit Parade of Tears, though. This is by Izumi Suzuki, and it's translated by Sambet, David Boyd, Helen O'Horan, and Daniel Joseph. And this is a collection of stories from the cult author, who I believe has won many, many literary awards in Japan. Izumi Suzuki had ideas about doing things differently, ideas that paid little attention to the laws of physics or the laws of the land. In this new collection, her skewed imagination distorts and enhances some of the classic concepts of science fiction and fantasy. Now, what intrigues me about this is that I read a lot of contemporary Japanese writers. I'm thinking of people like Sayaka Murata, who writes these very twisted, novels, and I'm intrigued to know how a kind of titan of the Japanese literary landscape shapes that industry, shapes that market perhaps, or what her influence might have been on authors of today, if any. And I think if you want to engage with like the modern literature, you also need to dive back into its history and see what else was being published, um, you know, the, the context that these authors grew up in. What were the authors of today reading to help kind of inspire a lot of literature for them. So I think that's why this fascinates me so much. That's Hit Parade of Tears, or Tears. I'll let you know in due course. By the way, all of these reviews will be coming soon. Now, another contemporary Japanese writer who I love. And by the way, August is Women in Translation Month. So take that as your sign that this month is the perfect month to pick up a book. Written by a woman in another language and then translated into yours. Um, this is Ms. Ice Sandwich. Uh, it's quite a short little novella. I love Miyako Kawakami's novels. I've read all three that have been translated into English so far, and this is my last shred of Miyako Kawakami's writing that has been translated while I wait for her next novel to be delivered to us. A young boy returns obsessively to a supermarket sandwich counter, entranced by the beauty of the woman who works there. He calls her Miss Ice Sandwich, and he wants nothing more than to spend his days watching her coolly slip sandwiches into bags. Honestly, I can relate because, <laughs> trust me, there's a point here. When I went to Japan, I tried strawberry sandwiches for the first time. It's like strawberries and cream in a sandwich, like two pieces of bread, strawberries, cream and it is just heaven. I think I ate like three of them a day. I kind of had a bit of a <laughs> dodgy stomach and then had the audacity to question why when I was spending so much time building my diet around strawberry sandwiches, but they were just incredible. I could have sat and watched the 7-Eleven employees bag those up <laughs> all day as long as they were being bagged into my bag and I was taking them home. But anyway, that isn't as I sandwich. And you know what? Who says romance is dead? sit and watch someone bag sandwiches all day. That's modern love, right there. The next book is called The Pachinko Parlor. This is by Elisa Schwa Dusapin and translated by Anissa Abbas Higgins. It's summer in Tokyo and Claire finds herself dividing her time between tutoring 10-year-old Mieko in an apartment. Wait a minute. <laughs> Miyako? Ariana, what are you doing here? <laughs> Miyako, what are you doing here? That was a weird coincidence, but a very good segue. Anyway, she tutors this 10 year old in an apartment hotel and lying on the floor at her grandparents' home, daydreaming, playing Tetris, and listening to the sounds from the streets above. The heat rises, the days slip by. When her grandparents first arrived in Tokyo, fleeing the civil war in Korea, they opened Shiny, a pachinko parlor. Shiny is still open, drawing people in with its bright flashing lights and promises of good fortune. And as Miyako and Claire gradually bond, a tender relationship grows. Miyako's determination to visit the pachinko parlor builds, and with it, Claire's own desire to visit Korea with her grandparents. Oh, so I feel like this is gonna be a story all about identity and family and belonging. And it's by the author of Winter in Sokcho, which is another great novel, which I really liked. So another author I am returning to. They always come crawling back, and by they, I mean me. And by crawling, I mean going into the bookstore and like filling up their tote bag. The next book is called Solo Dance. This is also translated from the Japanese by Arthur Reiji Morris, but originally by Lee Kotomi. It's about a character who is 27 and originally from Taiwan, who is working an office job in Tokyo. While her colleagues worry about the economy, life insurance policies, marriage and children, she is forced to keep her unconventional life hidden, including her sexuality and the violent attack that prompted her move to Japan. There is also her unusual fascination with death. She knows from personal experience how devastating death can be, but for her it is also creative fuel. Solo Dance depicts the painful coming of age of a gay person in Taiwan and corporate Japan. This striking debut is an intimate and powerful account of a search for hope after trauma. Well, that kind of speaks for itself, doesn't it? And it was the winner of the Gunzo New Writers Prize for Excellence, so I am expecting 
excellence. This is actually an Indonesian book, and what's really interesting about this is that this was translated into English by the original author. So it's by D.S. Novita Wuri, and she has translated Birth Canal from its original language, which I believe is Indonesian, into English. So this was recommended by Books and Bao, which is one of my favourite YouTube channels. In the booktube space, they recommend loads of really great translated fiction, and I watched their video on Women in Translation Month, and this was the recommendation that I took. It's a dazzling novella from a rising star of Indonesian literature, exploring generational legacies, lost love, the damage that war does to men, and the damage that men do to women, and it's set in Jakarta. All of those themes sound very, very interesting, so looking forward to this one. This this book was translated from Norwegian. It's by Tage Vesaz and translated by Elizabeth Rocken, and it's called The Ice Palace. And another one of my favourite channels on Booktube is Emmy. And I know that she reads a lot of, firstly, classic literature, but secondly, translated literature. And I think we're both on this kind of mission to read books from all around the world, and I recently read my first Norwegian book, which was called Paradise Rot, and I thought it was brilliant. And that was a quite modern contemporary novel, whereas this is a bit more of a Norwegian classic. And so I was drawn to it. The school children call it the Ice Palace, a frozen waterfall transformed into a fantastic structure of translucent walls, sparkling towers, and secret chambers. It fascinates two young girls who strike up an intense friendship. When one of them decides to explore the Ice Palace alone and doesn't return, the other must try to cope with the loss of a friend without succumbing to a frozen world of her own making. Ooh, so I feel like the physical structure of the Ice Palace is also going to kind of become a metaphor for this emotional iciness and coldness in like grief and loss. Wow. Oh, I'm excited about this. I am so excited about this. Ho <laughs> ho! Okay, this next book is my nerdy little passion. <laughs> I'm so interested by the life of Samuel Johnson. He is the guy who wrote the first dictionary, and this is a biography of his life. So this is Samuel Johnson A Life by David Noakes, and I'm just going to nerd out and learn more about Samuel Johnson. And you know when you have like a hyper fixation on something? I've been hyper fixating on Samuel Johnson for like five years now. I just am so enthralled by him. I've watched so many documentaries, read so many articles, but I wanted to read a full biography, so that's why I have this one. Someone else who just I'm captivated by was Joan Didion. This book means that I now have her complete collection of works. This is the final book that I needed to buy to have her full back catalogue, and this is Blue Nights. Now, you may know Joan Didion for, I think probably her most well-known book is The Year of Magical Thinking, and that precedes this book, because The Year of Magical Thinking is written about... So basically, Joan Didion's daughter was in hospital, and then her husband quite suddenly passed away. And so The Year of Magical Thinking is all about kind of trying to grapple with that whole thing. And then, because Joan Didion just could not catch a break for five minutes shortly after the publication of The Year of Magical Thinking, her daughter died. She was only 39, and like, can you imagine being Joan Didion in that situation. She had just lost her husband, now she's lost her daughter. This book is described as raw and filled with loss, and of course, I just, it's incredible that she wrote something in that time, and so I'm just in awe of her, really and truly, and so that is Blue Nights. Okay, now I have two books by another of my favourite authors, Toni Morrison. I really think that Toni Morrison might be my favourite author of all time. I think it's a toss-up between Toni Morrison and James Baldwin. <sighs> I just think they're so brilliant, and so I'm just on a one-man mission to read as much Toni Morrison as I am humanly capable of. Her book Sula is just, I think, one of the best things I've ever read, and so I got Song of Solomon, and then also, earlier this year, I went to a talk at Hay Festival given by Caleb Azuma Nelson, who is one of my favourite modern authors. He wrote Small Worlds and Open Water, and when someone said, what book really inspires you, he said Jazz by Toni Morrison. His book, Small Worlds, is all about a jazz player, and I really enjoyed how lyrical the book was, and it felt like reading sheet music, because there was just this rhythm to his writing, and so knowing that this was a kind of muse, or at least an inspiration, or informed his writing in some way, meant that I I needed it in my life. And so yeah, this is Jazz by Toni Morrison. So two books by her, which I cannot wait to just try and absorb by osmosis, like every brilliant thought that was in her brain. Speaking of authors whose work I've read a lot of, I've also read a lot of Charles Bukowski's poetry. Now, 
his poetry can often be morally questionable, if not abhorrent, but the man could write. And this is a collection of his letters, which all share the common theme of writing. These are his letters where he talks about the craft and the art of writing. He says art itself is an excuse. I just started reading it literally today because I'm going on a writing trip tomorrow to do some research for my novel that I'm working on and so I just to get some motivation and to get me pumped I picked up On Writing by Charles Bukowski because I really love reading writers on writing you know writers reflecting and ruminating on the craft of writing the thing that they dedicated their life to and Bukowski was such a character it really comes through in his letters too so um, that is on writing. Sticking with the theme of letters, this is Franz Kafka's Letters to Mylena. Now Mylena was his lover. So these are Franz Kafka's letters to his one-time muse Mylena Jesenka, an intimate window into the desires and hopes of the 20th century's most prophetic and important writer. So they met in 1920 when she was translating one of his early works and their relationship developed into this really deep attachment and so much so that he showed her his diaries and essentially laid bare his soul. Their relationship actually only lasted two years and Kafka died shortly later. And when Mylena died 20 years later at the hands of the Nazis, she left these letters. And so now we are so lucky to get to read these. I mean, would you want someone to read your love letters? I don't know. <laughs> That's, I guess the modern equivalent is like someone going through your Tinder profile messages, which respectfully, I don't need to read your Tinder messages, but I would like to read Franz Kafka's love letters to Mylena. And so I'm gonna stick with these. Now, one thing I wanted to talk about is how this past year, I have been going through it. I feel like, you know when people say they're like the main character in their lives? I don't know if I was the main character, but I think I was like a side character for most of my life. And then in the last year, the writers of the show were like, screw that character. <laughs> How can we mess with this character? Let's suddenly give this character a plot line. Let's give him his own season. And so in this season of my life, there's just been one thing after another, you know? It's been a lot for one little brain to try and get through. And what has really been helping me is by starting to go to therapy. And I've been doing that online because the way that my lifestyle kind of operates, it's hard to commit to something in person and anything that prevents you from doing something that will be important and powerful and empowering for you, you need to get rid of those obstacles. And so online therapy has been what I turned to and better help. So this next brief segment is a paid partnership, but it's something that is really important to me and close to my heart. And so it's something that I really wanted to talk about because if something is interfering with your happiness and preventing you from achieving your goals, therapy can give you the tools to approach life in a different way. Regardless of whether you have a clinical mental health issue, you could just be going through a really rough patch and find it beneficial to talk to someone. And BetterHelp's mission is to make therapy accessible. And this is such an important and appreciated mission because finding a therapist can be very hard, but BetterHelp is a platform that makes finding a therapist easy because it's on Online, it's remote and by filling out a few questions, BetterHelp can match you with a credentialed therapist in as little as a few days. It's easy to sign up and get matched with a therapist and there's a link in my description which is betterhelp.com slash edwards and clicking that link gets you 10% off your first month of therapy on BetterHelp so you can connect with a the therapist and see if it helps you. Also I think it's really important to note that finding your perfect therapist is a little bit like dating in the sense that if someone isn't the right match for you, it's important that you note that and you can easily switch therapists actually on BetterHelp. Online therapy for me has really given me a soundboard and a safe space and helped me feel like I'm taking back control of my life, which is important. So if you are struggling, consider online therapy with BetterHelp and you can click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com edwards. Next, this book is called Half of a Yellow Sun and I bought this because it is this month's pick in Dua Lipa's book club with Service95, which is her kind of lifestyle newsletter. And she does this really interesting book club. And so far, the first two months picks were Shaggy Bane and Pachinko, which are brilliant books and the perfect books to discuss in a book club because they just bring out so many questions, so many discussion points. And so, because I want to, I want to think, I want to engage this brain <laughs> every now and then, I'm taking Dua Lipa's book recommendations very strongly. So this is Half of a Yellow Sun. It won the Women's Prize for Fiction and 
A lot of my favourite books have won the Women's Prize for Fiction. I really trust their judgement. In 1960s Nigeria, three lives intersect. Amongst the horror of Nigeria's civil war, loyalties are tested as these three people are pulled apart and thrown together in ways that none of them imagined. It's described as vividly written, thrumming with life, a remarkable novel. With searching insight, compassion, and an unexpected yet utterly appropriate touch of wit, Adishia has created an extraordinary book. Well, do you see why I bought that? It sounds so good. And I do have a video coming very, very soon about Dua Lipa's book club, and you're gonna wanna watch that one. That one's, yeah, you should keep an eye out for that one. Next, hello, signed copy. That's right, we have a signed copy. This is Megan Nolan's Ordinary Human Failings, which could also be the name of my autobiography. Noted. Her other book, Acts of Desperation, was one that I enjoyed but didn't love, and reading it, I knew that Megan Nolan was an author I wanted to read something else from. You know, sometimes one book doesn't necessarily like tickle your pickle in the right way, but you kind of know that this author's writing style is something that I am interested by and could get on board with. That's very much how I felt with Megan Nolan, so I've been kind of waiting <laughs> eagerly for her next release, and here it is, it's in my hand. And I also think it's about journalism, and I always wanted to be a journalist when I was younger, so always interested to read about that kind of thing. It's 1990 in London, and Tom Hargreaves has it all. A burgeoning career as a reporter, fierce ambition, and a brisk disregard for the peasants, ordinary people, his readers, easy tabloid fodder. His star looks set to rise when he stumbles across a scoop, a dead child on a London estate, grieving parents loved across the neighbourhood, and the finger of suspicion pointing at one reclusive family of Irish immigrants and bad apples, the Greens. At their hearts it's Carmel, beautiful, otherworldly, broken, and once destined for a future beyond her circumstances, until life and love got in her way. Crushed by failure and surrounded by disappointment, there's nowhere for her to go and no chance of escape. Now with the police closing in on a suspect and the tabloids hunting their monster, she must confront the secrets and silences that have trapped her family for so many generations. Wow. How cool does that sound? These next two books are called The Book of Goose, and it's by Yeon Lee, and Best of Friends by Kamala Shamsi. Now, I went to a talk about friendship in literature where these two authors were on the panel and basically the way that they spoke about friendship and their novels that they'd written about friendship, specifically female friendship, just had me in the palm of their hands. Both, each of them, the palm of each of their hands and they were like this, just holding me in the centre and what they said was, buy our books. And so I did, because <laughs> I am nothing if not easily influenced. They'd each said like one sentence and it was just pure genius and I was just immediately like on my way to the counter to buy the books that they'd written because they just sounded brilliant. I believe this one is about someone who finds out that her childhood best friend has died and is finally kind of free to share the real story behind their lives together. And this one is about a lifelong friendship that's kind of brought to breaking point where they realise that actually maybe they've been friends out of convenience and because they've been friends for a long time, as opposed to actually being compatible friends. And so I'm always intrigued by how friendship is portrayed in literature, because I really do think that friendship is the great love of your life, and that's a hill I will die on. If someone could send me the coordinates for the nearest hill, me and the Grim Reaper will be on our way. Thank you very much. Next, Gillian. This is by Halle Butler, and controversially, I didn't enjoy Halle Butler's last book. It was called The New Me, and I just didn't find her writing style very engaging, but I wanted to give her another go. Megan is only 24, but her life feels like a dead end. Working as a gastroenterologist's receptionist, does anyone know what that means? Gastro must mean stomach. Enterologist. Entering the, the, they're entering people's stomachs? Like, are we not, we're not gonna explain <laughs> what that means? Is it to do with dogs? Is this like common knowledge that I should know? I feel like a dummy now. Am I making myself like an idiot on the internet? I need gastroenterologists for dummies. Gastroenterologist. Honestly, I'm impressed I spelled that right first time. Oh, a doctor who treats digestive disorders. I'll take it. I wasn't that far off. Anyway, she, she just works as a receptionist. That might not even be relevant to the story. She's resenting the success and the happiness of her friends, and the only thing that makes her feel better is obsessively critiquing the behavior of her colleague, Jillian. Jillian's not a dog, I think. Wait, hang on. Nope, she's a grotesquely optimistic 35-year-old single mother. Gillian's chirpy positivity obscures her mounting struggles until her downfall is precipitated 
by the purchase of a dog. I was wondering when the dog was going to come in. How? I wonder how your downfall could be precipitated by the purchase of a dog. I'm... I want to find out. One thing I did just find out is that my copy of this book is ripped. That's not great. Huh. That's a tragedy. I reckon I can fix that. Someone said it reads like a junk food binge. That's a great... If someone described my book like that, I would give them a big kiss on the forehead. That... What a nice way to describe a book. So... Okay, next pile. We're not even nearly done. That, how fun is that? The next book is called Loat, and when I was at Hay Festival, I was asking authors for book recommendations, and I met an author called Alice Wynn, who wrote a book called In Memoriam, which has seen a lot of success this year. She's very celebrated, people absolutely love that book. And I asked her for a book recommendation, and I have never heard someone describe a book with so much passion in my life, and I work in the book industry. She was talking about how fantastic Loat is. It's by Shola von Reinhold. It won some awards, but the sticker is too small for my eyes to see. And it's basically about the bright young things. Now, there's a book called Vile Bodies by Evelyn Waugh, which is one of my favourite books I've ever read. And it's about these people in like 1920s London, kind of what was happening in like the London social scene while The Great Gatsby was happening in New York. That's the best way I can describe it like people known for their extravagance and being very ostentatious and their artfulness as well and basically this is a book about a black woman who has always been enamored by the bright young things and yet never saw herself in that scene because for the most part it was incredibly white now she discovers this photograph of a forgotten black modernist poet who ran in the same circles as the bright young things that she adores she becomes transfixed by this poet and is basically looking to find out as much as she possibly can about this person. Matilda's journey through modes of aesthetic expression guides her to truth and the convoluted ways it is made and obscured. I cannot wait to read this. Oh my god. It sounds incredible. This could end up being a new favourite book. I, If I could get into the future, <laughs> you might think life would be a breeze. I'm having a That's So Raven vision of me just eating this up. It's gonna happen. Now, my friend, my TikTok friend, Jaden, who is from Australia, was visiting London. We had like two hours to hang out. And of course we went to a bookshop and we each bought each other a book that we thought the other one would like. I got him 12 Days in June by Tia Williams. I think he had a quick debrief with the bookseller in the store and basically described what he was looking for. And then she recommended this book. And so it's by Elliot Duncan. In the first of three acts, Ponyboy's titular narrator, a pill-popping, speed-snorting, transmasculine lightning bolt unravels in his Paris apartment. Ponyboy is caught in a messy love triangle with Baby, a lesbian painter who can't see herself being with someone trans, and Tony, a childhood friend who can actually see Ponyboy for who he is. An evocative debut novel of art and addiction, self-destruction and reconstruction, Ponyboy thrums with the joys, aches and pains of becoming who you are meant to be. I think that sounds like a roller coaster ride. And I think that Jaden knew that I loved character studies, experimental fiction, and also Paris. I love Paris so much, so um, that is Ponyboy. Oh, this book I have already read. This is Open Throat by Henry Hoke. What a bizarre little thing. So this is a book about this mountain lion who has been this kind of voyeur of human society and human culture from the margins, from the fringes for a long time. And it's about him kind of coming into human civilization. And it is really moving, very playful, but also profound and really interesting storytelling. I feel like the less you know going into this book, the better. I just thought it was great. It took me a minute to get going with it, but once I did, it really has this momentum that builds up to a crescendo. And I thought it was really cool. Next, we have this book, which I just kept seeing this cover and thinking it was brilliant. So it's called Toad, but we have a caterpillar on fire on the cover. It's by Catherine Dunn, and it's described as colourful, crass, and profound. Toad is Catherine Dunn's ode to her time as a student at Reed College in the late 1960s. It's daring and bizarre, it demonstrates her genius for black humour and her ecstatic celebration of the grotesque. Fifty-some years after it was written, Toad is a timely story about the ravages of womanhood and a powerful addition to the canon of feminist fiction. Right? Right? Sometimes I feel like you don't need me to explain why I bought the book, like it sounds so good and with a cover like that, I'm sorry. Sometimes I judge books by their covers, I'm human, I am weak, I'm a man-child with a bank card <laughs> and I see the pretty thing, I'm like a magpie and I take it to the counter and I'm like, I cash or card? <laughs> how can I, how can I 
take this home with me. So that's Toad. Also, Toad, very triggering, reminds me of the Mario movie that I slept through. Don't remind me. Anyway, next book is one that you might have seen everywhere on the internet, and that is Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yaros. Now, I've seen so many people who are not necessarily fantasy lovers finding this romanticy novel, which is like the hybrid of romance and fantasy, finding it really, really good. Um, brutal games, grumpy dragons, sizzling sexual tension. I mean... Sounds pretty good if you ask me. The one thing that throws me about this is the tagline is graduate dot 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 or die. <laughs> Which, <laughs> you know, is so dramatic. And also how I felt for 90% of my degree. But mine didn't have dragons. So as compelling as it is, deadly, a wild, sexy roller coaster of a ride. The thing is, I would read you the blurb, but it's honestly like a modern foreign language. Like, I. There's so many words in here, because it's a fantasy book, the blurb includes a lot of the like world building, so it's like the name of the school that they go to, the name of the war that they're fighting, all of these different things, and like, it literally doesn't make any sense. So I think it's just a book that I need to dive into, go in with an open mind as not your typical fantasy reader. I really want to give this a go, and I'm making a video on um, the most popular books on BookTok and BookTube, and this will be included, so you will be seeing a review very, very soon. And fantasy lovers, just enjoy this moment where you're seeing me hold a fantasy book because it doesn't happen often. <laughs> so I hope you're making the most of this. This is your, this is for you. I have no beef with the fantasy genre. It's just not a genre that I usually enjoy. I know that a lot of people find so much escapism and, and joy in those books. And that's what makes reading so fun is that we all have different tastes. But the one thing that I really can get behind is mythology, a mythological retelling, specifically Greek. I have three books. Firstly, this one is Pandora. London, 1799. Dora Blake lives with her uncle in what used to be her parents' famed shop of antiquities. When a mysterious Greek vase is delivered, Dora is intrigued by her uncle's suspicious behaviour and enlists the help of Edward, a young antiquarian scholar. For Edward, the ancient vase is the key to unlocking his professional future. For Dora, it's a chance to restore the shop to its former glory and to escape her nefarious uncle. But what Edward discovers about the vase has Dora questioning everything she has believed about her life, her family, and even the world as she knows it. Now in mythology, opening Pandora's box, it causes some troubles. And this book says some doors are kept locked for a reason. So I think that it's gonna kind of open a can of worms, which is I guess the modern way of saying, open Pandora's box. It says it weaves together ancient Greek myth with suspenseful mystery and irresistible, so I couldn't resist. Now what's interesting about these next two books is they are both about the same myth, they're both about the same story. So these are both about Penelope, who was the wife of Odysseus, and when he went off to fight in the Trojan War, she stayed home on the island of Ithaca. And these two books are feminist retellings of the story of Penelope, but this is the Penelope Iad by Margaret Atwood. I think the Iad bit means song, which is why the Iliad is the song of Troy, because the Iad bit means song, so I guess this is the song of Penelope, which is also why the song of Achilles is called the song of Achilles, because the Iliad which is the story that includes Achilles, is the song of Troy, because Troy was also known as Ilion. So anyway, all that to say, this is the Penelope ad, and then this one is just called Ithaca, but they're basically both the story of Penelope, who has kind of been immortalized in our Greek mythology as this really devoted wife to Odysseus. So with these, we get to hear her story. And the reason that I bought both is because feminist Greek mythological retellings are really having a huge moment in the spotlight right now. And I was just intrigued to see if I could read two authors telling the same story and from a writing perspective, think about how they tell that story differently. What they each choose to highlight, what they miss out. I don't know, just from like a craft perspective, I was intrigued by that. And that's how we justify buying both when we can't decide. We're like, it's, it's because of the craft of writing. I'm intrigued about the art. <laughs> I'm not just obsessed with buying books. Next up, this book, I cannot wait to read. It's called True Biz, it's by Sarah Novich, and this novel plunges readers into the halls of a residential school for the deaf, where they'll meet Charlie, a rebellious transfer student who's never met another deaf person before, Austin, the school's golden boy whose world is rocked when his baby sister is born hearing, and February, the hearing head mistress. Of course, they have a character called February. Only, only in a book would you get <laughs> someone called February. Anyway, she is a coda, which means child of deaf adults, who is fighting to keep her school open and her marriage intact, but might not be able to do both. 
as a series of crises, both personal and political, threaten to unravel each of them, Charlie, Austin, and February find their lives inextricable from one another and changed forever. This is a story of sign language and lip reading, disability and civil rights, isolation and injustice, first love and loss, and above all, great persistence, daring, and joy. It's about the deaf community and a universal celebration of human connection. There are gaps in my reading, and the deaf community is definitely one of them. I actually took sign language classes while I was at university and have a qualification in sign language, but mine is BSL, so British Sign Language, not American Sign Language, which this is based on and discusses, but I had a deaf teacher and she would explain to us a lot about deaf culture. She always made sure that in every, we had like these two hour lessons on a Friday afternoon and for the last 15 minutes every week she would um, teach us about deaf culture and that was honestly the most valuable part of the whole thing. She was such a wonderful teacher and I valued that time so so highly so um, I'm really looking forward to reading this book. And uh, there's also, there's a little fun fact about me as well. <laughs> this next book is called Brutes. It's by Diz Tate, and actually this is another signed edition. Get me. Who does he think he is? Actually this was complete coincidence. I, I ordered this book online and it came and it just happened to be signed. So that was a win. In Falls Landing, Florida, a place built of theme parks and swampy lakes, something sinister lurks in the deep. A gang of 13-year-old girls obsessively orbits around the local preacher's daughter, Sammy. Again, 13-year-olds, terrifying. Is this a horror? <laughs> when, I, when I find out the book is about 13-year-olds, I'm like, that it's, it's gotta be of the horror genre. Did Stephen King write this? Anyway, <laughs> that's not the point. So we're talking about Sammy. Sammy is mesmerizing, older, and in love with Eddie, but suddenly Sammy goes missing. Where is she? Watching from a distance, they edge ever closer to discovering a dark secret about their fame-hungry town and the cruel cost of a ticket out. What they uncover will continue to haunt them for the rest of their lives. Darkly beautiful and brutally compelling. It's about young friendship and the moment it is broken forever. This isn't the same thing, but I remember this quote from John Steinbeck, I think in East of Eden, where he says, the moment that you realize that your parents are human and fallible and can make mistakes, is like the gods crumbling from the sky, like falling from the sky. And I think that's true for all kind of childhood realizations, you know, you have those early friendships that are really formative and seeing young friendship broken is one of those kind of paradigm shifting moments. So that is Brutes. Sounds pretty cool. By the end of these videos, I run out of ways to say I'm interested and excited to read this book. But that's how I feel. Okay, what I don't have to say that about is this one, because this is If an Egyptian Cannot Speak English by Nur Naga. Now I realize I introduced that in such a weird way. Here's a book I'm not excited to read. No, <laughs> that's not what I mean. What I mean is I've already read it because I couldn't resist. I was so excited and this was a five star read for me. Super experimental. This is in three acts, but the third act just completely flips the fourth wall on its head. It's a story about one person who moves to Cairo and a local person who lives in Cairo. It's about them falling in and out of love. And I just thought it was the most brilliant study on perception, how we perceive ourselves, how other people perceive those exact same things, about communication, about diaspora, about culture, about living at the margins. It was so cool. I don't think it will be for everyone, I have to say. Um, kind of like Sally Rooney, it doesn't use quotation marks, which I know some people find very annoying. It has a lot of very quotable lines. It's a little abstract, so I would just put that out there. I don't think this will be for everyone, but I, I loved it. So that is If an Egyptian Cannot Speak English. Now this book, Chain Gang All Stars is being heralded as the new Hunger Games. A revelation, electrifying, defiant, or inspiring leads with love. It is about a highly controversial program within America's prison system. In packed arenas watched by millions of live stream viewers, prisoners compete as gladiators for the ultimate prize, their freedom. So we follow this one character and as she prepares for her final encounters, as protesters gather at the gates, and as the program's corporate owners stack the odds against her, Will the price be simply too high? This, I think, is going to be such a conversation starter, very thought provoking, and I'm all here for another kind of dystopia. I feel like The Hunger Games is kind of coming back into our like cultural psyche. I mean, the new film is about to come out at the end of this year. It feels like the right time to be dipping our toes back into a new concept like that. But let's not put the pressure of it being like The Hunger Games. You know, sometimes it's just marketing that they have to say like, it's kind of, if you like the Hunger Games, you might be interested in this. You know, you don't wanna go in with the perception that it's going to be the new Hunger Games, but I think it's gonna be of the same ilk. So, great word, ilk. 
I think we should use Ilk more often. <laughs> I don't think Ilk is used enough. Next book is Burnham Wood by Eleanor Catton. Burnham Wood is on the move. A landslide has closed the Korowai Pass on New Zealand's South Island, cutting off the town of Thorndike and leaving a sizeable farm abandoned. The disaster presents an opportunity for Burnham Wood, a gorilla gardening collective that plants crops wherever no one will notice. But they hadn't figured on the enigmatic American billionaire Robert Lemoine, who also has an interest in the place. Can they trust him? And as their ideals and ideologies are tested, can they trust each other? It's described as a literary thriller, Shakespearean in its wit, drama and immersion in character. It is also a brilliantly constructed tale of intentions, actions and consequences, with an unflinching examination of the human impulse to ensure our own survival. Ooh, it's like, what would you do in that scenario? And this is um, by a winner of the Booker Prize. And again, the Booker Prize and the Women's Prize are two prizes that I hold in very high regard, and I'm always um, keeping a close eye on their short lists and long lists, um, because they promote a really interesting selection of books. So that's Burnham Wood, baby. Next we have some poetry. We have um, two poetry books. This one is called Crush, and this I did read it did make me cry, I will not lie to you. It's about yearning and the loss of a first love. It's kind of in that same breed of books of like, call me by your name, swimming in the dark, Giovanni's room, that kind of thing, but in poetry form. And it is really gorgeous. So that is Crush by Richard Sykin. And then the other poetry collection I bought is the Highline Scavenger Hunt. Now in New York, I have lived at both ends of the High Line. My first New York apartment was in the West Village, and then I moved to Hudson Yards, which is the other side of the High Line. And, you know, it's really interesting because the West Village does have this kind of residential townhouse vibe. Lots of cute local coffee shops, people walking their dogs. Halloween there was amazing because everyone had really elaborate Halloween decorations. It feels very lived in. It really has this heart and soul. Whereas Hudson Yards is like the new area of New York, where it's these high rises, a lot of which are completely empty, and it's still kind of finding its feet, that area, like it's still kind of finding its culture, which comes with time, of course. Um, and so that is very interesting to me. But anyway, this is a book about the thing that connects them, and that is this old, abandoned, disused railway track, which has now been converted into this landscape for art and culture and agriculture and botany, you know, there's lots of plants and flowers and trees. And anyway, this collection by Lucas Crawford delves into the history of the High Line, an elevated train track, now a reclaimed public park. The adjacent neighbourhoods were known for early transsexual community, for AIDS activism, kink and leather clubs, transsex work, queer youth and more. These poems braid transgender history, autobiographical reflection, and architectural speculation into a commentary on the histories now lost to gentrification and the possible futures of the space. I just, literature is so amazing, man, and that's why we read. That is why we read. Okay, that's the scavenger line high, nope, that's the Highline scavenger hunt. <laughs> so close, but so far. I'm going a little delulu, and we have so many books left. How you doing? How, are you hanging on in there? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you are. Next, I have two essay collections because sometimes I like to pretend to be smart. And I feel like I want to read some essay collections because I am sick of being that person who's like, oh, I was reading an article about this the other day and what I really mean is I saw it on TikTok. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh yes, I was reading this thing. What I mean is I saw a TikTok about it and now I think I'm the expert on this subject and I'm not. I want to be able to say I read an essay about this the other day and it actually be true. So I have some essay collections. This first one is called Quietly Hostile. After fleeing Chicago to quarantine at home in Michigan, Irby finds herself bleaching groceries and wondering if her upper lip hairs are visible on Zoom. She was having a career high, but she's also trying to keep her life together. Our friend in print is back on point and ready to take us with her. So I feel like Samantha Irby is just a very highly celebrated essayist and so I want to know her. I want to, I want to read what she has to say. And then also this is Lost in Summerland by Barrett Swanson. Barrett Swanson is our eloquent guide on this tour through the toxic masculinity industrial complex, disaster capitalism and other exhibits of a lonely lost America. God that sounds like the most depressing Disneyland you'll ever go to, but something that will be great to read about, so that is Lost in Summerland. Next, modern German classic, this is Patrick Suskin's Perfume, the story of a murderer. It's described as witty, stylish, and ferociously absorbing. I feel like I want to invite this book to my dinner party. It's about someone abandoned on the filthy streets of 18th century Paris as a baby who grows up to discover he has an extraordinary gift, a sense of smell more powerful than any other humans. 
gradually he learns how to exploit this gift because because of course he learns how to exploit it. <laughs> oh, in the art of creating the most sublime perfumes in France. Okay, I really, I really underestimated him. I have to apologize, sorry to that man. I immediately thought that he was the murderer. Um, that was my bad. Yet there is one odor he cannot capture, the scent of an innocent young virgin. In order to protect his experiments, he must have his final ingredient at any cost. A cult international bestseller about obsession and death. Okay, so I think he is the... <laughs> I think he is the murderer. Speaking about roller coasters, that that was a ride. I take back my apology. I th I'm gonna read the book and I'll get back to you on that. Maybe I wasn't underestimating him. Maybe I was perfectly estimating him. Anyways, that's perfume. And it's on the ever-growing TBR. Next, this book is so freaky just to look at. It's called Hysteria. Um, and Hysteria is such an interesting word because hyster comes from the word for womb, hence hysterectomy, and so hysteria I always think is such a fascinating concept because it is linguistically so closely associated with dismissing women as mad. So I feel like that's what this book is going to be about, it's a novel by Jessica Gross. In hysteria we meet a young woman an hour into yet another alcohol feud masochistic sexual bender at her local bar. There is a new bartender working this time, one she hasn't seen before, and who can properly make a drink. He looks familiar, and she is consumed by shame from her behaviour the previous week, hooking up with her parents' colleague and her roommate's brother. Damn. Is that the same is that the same person or are they two are they two different people? Was it like the craziest threesome you ever heard of? She also becomes convinced that her Brooklyn bartender is actually Sigmund Freud. Right. Those must have been some strong rum and cokes. <laughs> they embark on a relationship and she is forced to confront her past through the prism of their complex, revealing, and sometimes shocking meetings. With the help of Freud, she begins to untangle her Oedipal leanings, her upbringing, and her desires. Jessica Gross's debut is unflinchingly perceptive and honest, darkly funny and unafraid of mining the deepest fears of contemporary lives. Jeez, these sound amazing. The thing is I collect these over like months to then show you in a haul, and I pick them up in bookstores and I'm like, whoa, that sounds so good, and then by the time it gets around to showing them to you, I've kind of forgotten. So this really is like, <laughs> this is my equivalent of a reaction video, like, you know the people who make FIFA reactions, Minecraft reactions? Welcome to BookTube. <laughs> Next up we have more mythology, so this is Threads That Bind. Io is descended from the fates, she can see threads, shimmering lines connecting people. When a relationship is formed, a new thread appears. When a person's life thread is cut, it's their time to die. Cool concept. That's a cool concept. One night, Io is witness to a violent, mysterious murder, along with Edie, a member of the dangerous mob who rule Alanti. And what Io can see immediately, although Eddie cannot, is that there is a bright silver fate thread connecting them. Ooh, this boy is her destiny. Simmering with romance, passion, mystery, and myth, this spellbinding story will leave you breathless. <sighs> I'm actually breathless from just reading the blurb, <laughs> honestly. But that sounds great, I'm gonna have to start stacking the books somewhere else, because we're running out of space here. Next I have Blue Skinned Gods. This is by S.J. Sindhu. The richness of this story will take hold of you and never let go. In India, a boy named Kalki, born with blue skin, believes he is the Hindu god Vishnu and that he can perform miracles. The truth, though, is much darker. As he struggles to extract himself from under his father's thumb, he must also reconcile with the idea that everything he's ever been told might not be true. When his father drags him on a tour of America, Kalki seizes the chance to explore what life as an ordinary man might be like. Interesting. Now, as I said, I love Greek mythological retellings, but I haven't read any books about the Hindu gods, and so, like I always say, I'm filling gaps in my kind of reading knowledge, and this is a big gaping gap. That was way too visceral. Anyway, this is called Beast in the Shadows. It's by Edogawa Rampo and translated by, well not translated, Yes, it is translated. It's translated by Ian Hughes. A mystery writer turns detective to protect the woman he loves, but is he hunter or hunted? Ooh, were you silent or silenced? The chance meeting between a crime novelist and a married woman blossoms into friendship. Oh, <laughs> that wasn't where I was expecting that to go. Anyway, when she confides to him that she has been receiving threatening letters from an ex-lover who says he is watching her in the shadows, he knows he must help her but the trail unexpectedly leads to another writer, the mysterious and secretive author of works of grotesque violence. Suddenly, nothing is as it seems, and nobody 
is safe. Ooh. And the next book is called Haunted Houses, where potentially no one is safe here either. Haunted Houses follows three young women and is a witty, bleak, and outrageous account of American girlhood. Okay, so that's not actually... Okay. <laughs> I very much took the title at surface value and, and face value and just thought it was also a horror book. It's This one's not. It's about the past within the present, the inescapability of private memory and public history in prose that is uncanny and precise. Electric, funny, tender, smart, and charismatic. All great words. All superlatives. All sound good in my book. And hopefully in this one. Okay. These books, I feel, are kind of like it girl books. <laughs> I'm on my quest to be an it girl. This is Walking Through Clear Water in a Pool Painted Black, a collection of stories by Cookie Miller. <gasps> Wait. This is by total coincidence. I put these in a stack in like an arbitrary order. The next book is by Olivia Lang, and this one is introduced by Olivia Lang. I, sw I swear, I swear the universe just glitched. We all just watched that happen. Like, the Matrix just glitched. How, what a weird coincidence. Well anyway, this is Walking Through Clear Water in a Pool Painted Black, a book that brings together the writings of the legendary Cookie Mon- no, <laughs> Cookie Mella. Cookie Mella. Every part, every fibre of my being wanted to say Cookie Monster. Every part of me. Cookie Mella is chronicling her high-risk, high-reward life in glorious Technicolor. So she was part of this legendary acting troupe and was also a big voice in critiquing the government's response to the AIDS epidemic in New York. Mella's work presents a testament to a life lived courageously and well and full of cookies. Easy segue, because Olivia Lang introduces that book, apparently. This is Funny Weather, Art in an Emergency, a collection of essays by prize-winning writer and critic Olivia Lang, which makes a brilliant case for why art matters. We're often told art can't change anything. Lang argues that it can. It changes how we see the world, it exposes inequality, and it offers fertile new ways of living. A thought-provoking, inspiring collection that you can go back to whenever the weather takes a funny turn. Next up, we have Post Traumatic. This is by Chantal V. Johnson. Can Vivian find happiness after what has been done to her? To the outside observer, Vivian is a success story, a dedicated lawyer who advocates for mentally ill patients at a psychiatric hospital. Privately, Vivian contends with the memories and after effects of her bad childhood, compounded by the everyday stresses of being a black Latina woman living in a white society. She lives in a constant state of hypervigilant awareness that makes even a simple train ride a heart-pounding drama. For years, Vivian has self-medicated with a mix of dating, dieting, dark humour, and smoking weed with her best friend Jane. But after a family reunion prompts Vivian to take a bold step, she finds herself alone in new and terrifying ways, without even Jane to confide in, and she starts to unravel. Will she find a way to repair what matters to her most? I also have The Deloriad. This is by Missouri Williams. In the wake of a mysterious environmental cataclysm that has wiped out the rest of humankind, a family descended from their incest- wait, hold on. A family descended from their incest- a family- a bit- <laughs> Oh no. That that left me speechless. <laughs> that, I, that just, that hit me like a train. I was not expecting that. Okay, let me try that one more time. A family descended from their incest claimed to existence on the edges of a deserted city. The matriarch, ruling with fear and force, dreams of starting humanity over again not through more incest, please. Though her children are not so certain, together the family scavenges supplies and attempts to cultivate the poisoned Earth. Did you see that coming? I didn't. Also, look at that evil little face. Well, crazy incest book. There you go. It's called Range. Look it up. Peter Biskind's Easy Riders Raging Bulls. This is all about the heyday of Hollywood, and it was actually recommended by Margot Robbie, and it has it has that like old book smell. I bought it secondhand. How the sex and drugs and rock and roll generation saved Hollywood. The Sunday Times says if there is a better book about the inside of the film industry. I'd like to see it. They said, show me show me the receipts then. You got a better book? Prove it. I like that. I think all book covers should be a little bit threatening. So that's Easy Riders Raging Balls. Two more guys. We're on the home stretch. This is C.A. Conrad's The Book of Frank. Outrageous, darkly comic, and frequently stunning in its flights of the imagination, The Book of Frank follows the eponymous figure as he grows from his troubled childhood into an adult travesty of modern man. He loses his soul in the past, debates boundary lines with a pig. 
He debates... We're back at the incest thing. He debates boundary lines with a pig. <laughs> Frank is unforgettable. I, it sounds that way. Um, touchingly innocent, monstrously cruel, and one of the truly great literary creations. So, does that not sound like something you want to read immediately? Because to me it does. And then the final book of the whole video, of the whole damn thing, is called Reward System. And you deserve a reward for being here all this time. My voice deserves a reward for somehow making it this far. Anyways, this is a Guardian and NPR book of the year, and the blurb is this. Julia has landed a fresh start as a chef at an up-and-coming city restaurant. Her ex-boyfriend Nick is flirting with sobriety and nobody else. Life should have started to take shape by now, but instead they're trying to make new versions of themselves, searching for a good answer to the question, what do you do? I felt like that didn't tell me much, but it did make me intrigued. Superb, funny, graceful, and acidly cynical. Lyrical. That's why I bought it. Every time I see the word lyrical in a book description, I'm like, I need it. I love lyrical books. I love books that feel like reading poetry, but it's also prose. I love something that is textured and meaningful, and I can't wait to consume all of these great pieces of fiction and non-fiction. There's some non-fiction in here too, for once. So, thank you so, so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, you can subscribe for more from me. You can give this video a like if you liked it, if you like. And check out the rest of my videos of me building this bad boy in the background, this um, home library. It's a little series I'm doing on my channel over the next two months, and I would love for you to come along for the journey. You can also find me on Instagram, on TikTok. I'm all over the place, and reviews... Well, literally, I you can find me all over the place, but mentally all over the place too. I'd love for you to join this little bookish family and thank you so much for watching this video. Love you to the moon and back. All the best, stay in touch. Have a wonderful day. Bye bye.